So to begin with, what we will do on day one is, um, we've already done with my introduction. So what we'll do is we will talk about a kind of orientation about the entire course. So we'll like, you know, do that for about five to 10 minutes. We'll keep it short. Um, and then we'll talk about exactly how each day's class is going to proceed. So um, going with, you know, the roadmap of the entire course, um, we have the, you know, kind of topic wise training plan uh, right here on my screen. But if you are looking for like detailed topic by topic listing of everything that we're going to talk about in the course, um, then the best place to check it would be on softwaretestinghelp.org. Um, right there we have a detailed syllabus with every minute aspect of it. But right here on my screen what you're seeing is like, you know, a high level uh, topic by topic, um, you know, kind of pointers on what we are going to do and in what order. Now we don't always strictly follow this order but we will try to do that as long as it feels organic and as long as it makes sense to what we are going to discuss. Another important thing is we will make sure that the class is on uh, mute most of the time. Uh, the reason for that is we have a lot of students participating from all around the world who probably cannot make it to the live class always. So as you all know, we provide a recording of every day session as soon as the class is done, again, about in about two hours after the class is done. So I'll tell you exactly about that as well. So lot, there are a lot of people who follow the session through the recording. And also, you know, recordings are great for us to go back and review the content of the class, which is a major plus of this program. So to make sure that we have a clean recording and we have a noise-free class, we, we you know, conduct the session usually in the um, muted format. But that doesn't mean that we are going to, like, you know, uh, follow the pattern of a monologue or anything. Um, my intent is to actually have this program in the way of a workshop. So please feel free to participate. And uh, just because we are on mute, that doesn't mean we cannot hear each other, talk to each other. Uh, please use the chat window as long as it is convenient. But if there's anything that you want to share with the class or me, just let me know through the chat again and I will unmute you and we can have like, you know, um, one by one conversation if, if needed, uh, you know. Uh, so uh, I really encourage you all to participate um, to the maximum extent. Uh, so coming back to the, uh, and also there's another way for you to raise your hand in the, um, you know, attendees panel. So you can do that as well to get my attention. Um, so you can use one of these ways to actually, you know, um, let me know that you have something to share with the class and I can make that happen. Uh, but otherwise we can use the chat window and all your messages are visible to everybody else. So that's a great thing as well. All right, so coming back to the training plan. Um, so we, as you all know, this program is, uh, the duration of the entire program is five weeks. And we are very, very um, uh, prompt with the time, I must say. So we will finish the class in the five weeks. I mean, as opposed to many other, uh, you know, training programs where uh, they say why five weeks, but it goes longer and longer. And, you know, each day's class is not very content dense. So that's not how it is with us. We will finish the class in five weeks. We will make sure that the two hours that you spend per day, three times a week with us is worth your while and that, you know, Every class is content dense. We will not waste any time. We will make sure that, you know, we are making the, because we are all busy and, you know, um, so we'll make sure that in the five weeks time, we will finish the course content and we will, you know, give everything the necessary importance that it deserves. So just give me a second. One of our participants has trouble with you uh, listening. Okay, so in the five weeks, what we will do is, um, so there are like, you know, three or four categories in, into which I would like to break down these five weeks. So week one would be the developmental life cycles. So when I say development life cycles, what we are trying to do is, now, first things first, QA is a part of IT projects. IT projects meaning software projects. So when you are a part of, you know, an IT industry, it's not just enough that we understand what happens in a QA project. So what happens in a software testing project. So it's a good idea to understand 
what are the other teams within the IT projects, what are their roles and responsibilities, how do they interact with us, if they need something from us, what is it that they would probably be looking for, and what kind of inputs as testers do we require from the other teams. So these are some important logistics that we all have to understand in order to be successful in our day-to-day, -day, you know, careers. So what we would do is we would try and take a look at the entire perspective of how project development happens, what are the different ways in which project development happens, so on and so forth. So the first week's topics are completely dedicated to the development life cycles. Having said that, wherever possible, we'll try and focus more and more on the software testing activities in each of these development life cycle methods. Now, Software development is one activity. There might be many ways that you can accomplish that. So the very common ways in which software development happens, or you know, the very common methods that are used, uh, one is the waterfall model, which we will be talking about in today's class. The second one would be V model, and the third is Agile model. Now these three are the ones that are most common, most prevalent, and you know, the ones that we probably need to have a good understanding to be able to perform, you know, um, successfully in our jobs. Um, there are other models as well, so there's prototyping, there is um, spiral models and all, uh, but all of those models to a certain extent are obsolete in the current days market and are no longer used. So if you have an academic interest, please read up and if you have any questions, you're welcome to bring them to the class. But these are the three models that we will be discussing. In the, in the program. So we will start with the software development life cycle, which is the waterfall traditional model. We model, we'll discuss the agile, and then we'll start the discussion slightly on the software testing life cycle, the different types of testing and things like that. Now, as I said, software development life cycle is a topic that has a wide span, wide range. It's more about, you know, everything in general, testing in particular. But starting week two and week three, what we would do is, um, we would like, you know, de-scope our focus to just software testing lifecycle. So we are going to focus just on testing projects and all the testing activities. But here we are going to take a microscopic view of every small aspect, every small topic of software testing lifecycle and try to discuss that with examples followed by assignments, so on and so forth. So for the period of next two weeks, we'll be spending on understanding the testing projects end to end. So again, uh, all of these topics as you can see. Now, starting week four, we would move into a completely different category of learning, and that is tools. Now, what are these tools, right? So here's uh, an example that I would like to give. I mean, very, very simple, probably lame. Um, but uh, so when, when we are going for, say, grocery shopping or when, when you want to like run errands, what do we do for maximum productivity? We just probably take a notepad and note down the things that we want to do, isn't it? So what are we doing here? Is the is the note writing actually grocery shopping? Not. It's not. It's not that, isn't it? It has no way. It is no way in relation to the actual activity, which is the grocery shopping. But why are we writing the list? Because we are trying to manage the activity, which is the grocery shopping. So, as much as it is important for us to do the actual work. It is also important for us to do it right, do it well, do it efficiently. So to do so, what are we doing here? We are managing our list. We are putting everything on paper, estimating like, you know, how much time it will take us, probably think about which store is the best one. So what we are doing here basically is just picking up the entire activity and like, you know, charting it down, planning it, managing it beforehand. So there are many types of activities in a software development project and software testing project. So to do to make things easier for us, there are also that many work management softwares or tools available for us. So there are three categories of work management that is very important for testers to understand. One is managing defects. So defects are pretty much you know uh, where our day begins and ends as testers. So finding defects is one thing, managing defects is another. And managing defects is actually much more tedious and much more harder and much more important than, you know, I mean, of course, finding defects is important as well. But this is something that will also um, need a certain level of efficiency to bring into the process. So managing defects is called defect management. And there are many defect management softwares that help us make this easy. So as testers, it is important for us to know 
to have a working knowledge of at least one defect management software to be successful real time. And the defect management software that we are going to look at is Bugzilla. So Bugzilla is like, you know, um, the pioneers in the, the defect management category. It is one of the earliest tools to be there in the market. Uh, so it's, I don't know when it came into existence, but it's been there since I have been in the QA field and it's still very, very popularly used. So what we will do is we will take a look at Bugzilla. So when I say we'll take a look at what we will do is, so this will be like a guided tour, like a tutorial. I will take you through this uh, process of setting it up to using it and you know uh, how do you practice more on it what are the areas that you should focus on so I'll give you like an end-to-end -end tour of these tools um, and the second thing that we will do in week four is we will look at test management software uh, which is QTest this is a QA Symphony test management software also very very you know um, I would say this is something that is recent, but at the same time, something that's gaining momentum at a very, very hard, uh, you know, fast pace. So definitely a great tool. And another tool that we will use is Jira. So Jira is also one of the premium choices for many com uh, premium choice for many companies when it comes to project management and incident management. So we are go going to look at three genres or you know three categories of tools: project management, test management, defect management. By the end of this, by the end of the day, all of these are work management softwares. Now you might be wondering why it is important to learn this. It's because, as I said earlier, it's not just important to do work, but it is important to do it effectively and efficiently. So work management softwares help you achieve that. So those are the three tools that we will take a look at in week four. And we will also go into automation testing. And the extent of automation testing as part of this program is to give you an idea of what it is, how it works, when should we use automation, if you are trying to learn automation, how do you go about it? So here's, uh, let, let me put it this way. At the end of this program, you will have an orientation towards automation, but you would by no means learn automation. So this is not an attempt to teach you automation because that's a different discipline Something that takes like, you know, uh, it, it's a kind of specialization in QA, so it, it takes separate time, effort, and, you know, um, also interest, aptitude. So we, we're not going to thrust automation on everybody here, but we will orient you. And to do so, we are going to use QTP um, or UFT for that matter. And in week five, we will focus on career. Um, resumes mock interview so we will have one session on resumes we'll talk about where we'll talk about how to create um, an effective resume and it is not going to be like you know a vague lecture on uh, how what kind of template you can use and you know what kind of font and all that so we will not really talk about those details we'll talk about how you can you know consolidate your skills I, i'm sure already in your minds there are a lot of questions so if you are somebody who's making a shift from a different field or if you are somebody who's new to it or if you are someone who has had a break in a career all of these are nagging questions in our minds how do how do i compensate for that how do i make sure that you know my resume shows my skills in the best positive light those are the very few practical uh, you know tips and tricks that we will talk about in the resume session We'll also have one such session on interviews. Again, this will not be a list of interview questions that I'll give you and ask you to read. Um, we respect you more than that, to be completely honest. So instead, we what, what we will try to do in the interview guidance session is we'll try to talk about, you know, how you can uh, put your best foot forward, you know, professional. So all of those things we'll talk about. And then there are a lot of certification programs available for, you know, uh, beginner level software testers. So we will do a comparative analysis of all the choices available and we'll also talk about things like why certification is important. Do you want to go for it or not? Should you go for it or not? If you want to go for it, what are the choices? Uh, so on and so forth. So those are the things that we will defer for week five. Um, and then also in week five, we there's a little bit of a buffer just in case if we don't finish any of the topics on time, um, this is where we can take it up. So this is the entire five weeks uh, calendar charted down for you. In addition to this, we have uh, daily um, assignments. Uh, my take on assignments is they are not mandatory. Um, so let me explain that for a second. When I say there are assignments at the end of every program, uh, so in end of every day, every class, um, this is like a small activity. Now, it's nothing major. It's nothing like, you know, um, 
that's going to be tedious or anything like that. It's it's a simple activity that we have at the end of every program, uh, every day, so that you can you know practice the concept that we learn in that day's class. So there are a lot of people who just joined this class to understand concepts. So by no means assignment is mandatory. But if you really want to work through everything, you're welcome to do the assignments. In addition to that, there's a lot of bonus material. I'm coming to that. So the bonus material will be sent in two parts. So part one, I'll send it to you at the end of today's session. Part two, you'll get it on the last day. Okay, so you will receive an email with all the instructions on how to download the material. So that you should get it uh, in about two to four hours after the class is done. Every day session is recorded and we also keep uh, running notes uh, of what we discuss in the class. Both of this content will be sent to you in an email from me in about two to four hours after the class is done. So I'll explain why we need two to four hours. Now, while the recording is happening, it records in a go to um, meeting format. After that, it has to like you know remove the codec and make it ready so it can, it can play in any device. So all that technical processing and then uploading it into a place where you can all view it, this takes a little bit of time. So, but within two to four hours, you should have an email from me with the link and instructions on how you can access the recorded session and the notes to the class. We also have a live application. So this is like an in-house project that we have that you all can use uh, for practicing your testing concepts. So that's another bonus. Um, yeah, so I think that's about, you know, all the, you know, uh, details that I had to give about the program. Um, any questions so far, team? Anything that you would like to know? Just a second, team. One of our um, team members is having a problem, so I just want to make sure we help her. Oh, all right. Um, so I, I just hope her issues get resolved and she's able to come back to the class. So regarding interview preparation, is it going to be one-on-one -on -one session? Um, see, here's my here's the deal. See, one-on-one -on -one sessions. We have done them in the past, but only when the other person has had an interview or when they are ready. So again, when we get to the week five, we can discuss more on this because, but then the software testing helps philosophy on interview preparation is not that, uh, it's not like a question and answer session. It, it's not going to be an interrogation. Interview is more about, you know, having a professional conversation. So if you have an interview in hand, if you want to prepare for it, and if you want like, you know, a one-on-one -on -one session, you can get in touch with us and we will probably, you know, arrange for a session for you. Vijay can actually do that. We can do that. Uh, but otherwise, we, we again, you know, it's a, it's a different philosophy altogether and we can discuss that in week five again. When can I talk about other course other than which is suited with my skills before the fifth week? Fifth week would be the best time and where to download the material. We talked about that already. I will send you an email with the instructions. Okay, so let's get started with what we are going to do today, team. Um, so QC is not covered. We have HPQ, uh, we have Q test instead, okay? So the, what I was going to say is today's class. So we have every day's class is two hours. So this is Monday, Wednesday, and Friday in United States. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> where did that come from? Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Sorry about that. Uh, so in this two hours, what we will do is we will, our class is broken down into three parts. One is the vocabulary. So we will try and talk about a few, you know, um, IT, QA terms that are commonly used. So it's like a jargon sort of a thing. And then what we will do is we will discuss one main topic. Followed by that, we will discuss. Um, so we will leave that with a practical concept or assignment to be much more precise. So this is the format of everyday session. You're free to ask the question. So I don't like to actually, you know, bundle up all the questions and ask them at the end. Uh, so as and when you have a question, feel free uh, feel free to post it, but again, you know, try to uh, keep it relevant to the topic that we're discussing. For example, when I'm talking about like software testing lifecycle or software development lifecycle, try not to ask a question that has to do with QTP or VB testing. So 
as long as we are in the context you're welcome to post the questions as and when you have them and i'll take them uh, you know when we take a logical you know break point in the discussion so let's get started and you know um we can take further questions in a little bit. So today we are going to start with the basic vocabulary which is software project domain technology platform and testing. I'm sure most of you know this already but please humor me. This is just to make sure that we start at the absolute zero. So what is software? So let's make this interactive. What do you think is software team? Use the chat window to respond to me. What is a software? Anything that comes to your mind? All right, I'll start this one. We'll build as we go. Uh, now, software is nothing but a piece of code. Thank you, Gayatri. And it is created to achieve a certain functionality. Okay, so a code that does a task, right? Is that correct? Now, when we think about why this task needs to be done, this task needs to be done because this is a solution to a particular problem. Am I correct in saying so? Now let's look at this scenario. Let's assume there is a, you know, let's assume there is a company that has offices in like three or four time zones, time zone one, two, and three. And all of these people need to have a conference where they can, you know, um, transmit content, like visually they should be connected and they also should be connected in terms that they can hear each other and talk to each other. So they need audio and video conferencing combined together. Probably they also want to record this. Now they have a problem that they cannot conduct this kind of a conference. Now, a software that comes as a solution for this is something like go to training or go to meeting that we are using right now to convene in a meeting together, isn't it? So every software is basically code. At its core, it's just code. But it's very important to remember that this code is not just any random, you know, programming um, language based statements. It's basically a code that is targeted at something. It is targeted to solve a certain certain problem um, and this is very important the reason why I'm emphasizing on that is it is very important for testers to understand what that problem is and how does this software solve it because otherwise we can always test a software say that it does not have a bug but we will never be able to say whether it is fit to use being fit to use is an important characteristic of a software and when that does not satisfy that we have essentially run into a defect so a software is nothing but a piece of code that is designed in order to provide a solution for a particular problem. So let's move on to the next one. What is a project? Now this is simple enough. So what is a project team? Anybody would care to join in? I know this kind of, you know, communicating <laughs> without the voice takes a little getting used to, I agree. All right, so project is nothing but any piece of work that needs to be completed. So over the weekend, if you just decided to um, do some, like, moving your lawn or anything like sm small thing that you want to finish accomplish is basically a project similarly in software in IT uh, a project might be like you know building a software a project might be testing it a project might be like you know maintaining the software so projects could be of various types and they could just they just mean that they are just tasks to be accomplished and within IT it is important to remember that every project needs some input, generates an output, so it requires an input and the inputs for uh, IT projects are usually time, money, effort, infrastructure. So time, money, effort, and infrastructure. And the output for the uh, IT project is some sort of um, either creating or, you know, um, improving 
a particular software. And yeah, so those are the two important logistics that we need to understand. And the activity of managing the input so that we have consistent outputs. That means, you know, making sure that when you uh, provide the correct amount of inputs and, you know, provide the inputs in the right order, provide your, do your tasks in the right order, that you um, end up at the consistent output every single time. The process of doing so is called project management. So the next thing is domain. Now, I have been asked about the domain so very many times. Um, every time, whether it is an interview or when I'm like, you know, trying to, you know, find um, a different position within the same organization, the same the question that comes to me is, do you have domain knowledge expertise, or what kind of domains have you worked on? So, and domain is one of the terms that intimidates even the best of us. Let's try and define what this is. Domain simply means it's a key business area. So what I mean, by, what is meant by this is, now let's look at sites like Walmart.com or eBay. eBay is slightly different, but again, um, Amazon or any other sites, for example, that does, you know, um, that sells products, commodities through an online medium are businesses that belong to e-commerce. And then there are businesses like, um, I don't know, bankofamerica.com, and there is chase.com. So all these American, uh, all these banks um, belong to the domain banking, or online banking to be more precise. So basically, all the applications that belong to a particular business area are called applications of a certain domain, belonging to a certain domain. And there are many uh, domains actually. So there's e-commerce, banking, finance, um, basically everything. So there's retail, all kinds of domains. Now, why is the domain knowledge important? Let's, let's actually spend a minute on that as well. Domain knowledge is important because, let's say you have been using like Yahoo Mail or uh, MSN or any other email clients. Now, if you were to be using any of these email clients and if you have to, for some reason, transition to Gmail, would that be difficult? Would that be like, you know, you will have to start over and, you know, learn everything new? Do you think that that's the case? Would this transition be difficult, Tim? Not at all, isn't it? This would be very easy. Why? Because you have previous work experience or, you know, previous familiarity. You are already familiar with how online email clients work. So it's just a matter of, you know, uh, using the exact same familiarity that you already have onto a different medium is all there is to this. So similarly, domain knowledge, people, uh, you know, employers look for domain knowledge because if I have already worked on, say, Amazon.com, that means I know how retail sites work, e-commerce sites work. So it's very easy for me to actually test, say, a site like eBay.com because I already know how, you know, those sites are supposed to work like. So domain knowledge will help ease the process. But on the other hand, when you look at it, what happens if you don't have the domain knowledge? What happens if you have not worked on Amazon.com before, if you have not tested that before? Does that mean it's going to work negatively for you? I don't think so because um, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I have never worked in two projects that belong to the same domain. But I never had a problem transitioning from one domain to the other. The reason why, uh, you know, that is the case is because as testers, we don't really, you know, um, so here's how I look at it. Now, testing is nothing but you are actually using the site, isn't it? Now, let's assume I'm trying to test if a user is able to buy a product from Amazon.com. So basically, when I'm a user, what I'm trying to do is I'm actually going to buy. I'm actually performing the task. Why? Because, you know, I want to, like, you know, utilize what that task offers me. But on the other hand, when I'm trying to buy something from Amazon as a tester, here I'm not looking for buying. I'm actually trying to validate 
will it work will it not work how is this working so basically whether I am trying to validate whether I'm buying trying to buy the steps to buy a product from Amazon is the same so what I'm trying to get at is that the activity that users perform and testers perform is exactly same on most systems the intent is the only thing that is different at the end of buying the tester will look for you know anomalies are there any problems but as a user you'd simply buy your product and you'd be done with that you're not going to analyze your activity of you know uh, buying the product so that is the difference I mean actually as users as testers we are users to IT as well which makes it um, so which means that we are never unfamiliar with some system but even though if we are this is how softwares work you provide an input to a system so this might be a mobile application a web application or a Windows you know standalone application it might be any application you're providing an input so let's assume this is a calculator the input that you provide is 2 and 4 and you want an addition on it so these are the three inputs that you provide so you are providing X Y and the operator what kind of action you want performed by the end of it you would have a result isn't it you would have six as your result so as long as the input that you provide and the output that you get is consistent that's enough for us as long as you understand what the system behavior should be like that's enough for us it does not matter in between what kind of system or what kind of processing happens so here's my take on domain knowledge if you have if you do possess the domain knowledge that's great I mean any skill is good to have but on the other hand not being familiar with a particular domain is not necessarily a, you know a negative factor for a, a tester to be successful in that domain but on the other hand if you're trying to build your career into becoming a business analyst in a particular you know domain then it's good to invest that time on learning a domain uh, better so don't worry about uh, no, the reason why I focus so much on this is uh, we've had a few requests from our um, you know past students saying that um, I mean the application that we give you as part of uh, live project is an e-commerce application so we've had many requests saying that can we get a banking project or you know uh, do you conduct like separate session on how to test a banking project all of these requests but uh, honestly speaking there's no difference in the way you test an application is an application as long as you understand it thoroughly there is no difference in the way you would treat that application depending on the domain but if you want to become a business analyst and you know grow in that area in the analysis side then you know uh, that is a completely different category of learning interest than what we are going to do here so coming back to the basic definition of what domain is it's basically a key business area next comes technology a um, lot of times I see resumes where they, they put the, uh, the project description is put after that the domain technology programming languages so all of these details are given so one of the questions I commonly ask when I look at resumes like that is what do you mean by technology so how did the technology play a part in how you tested it technology simply means that what are the technical you know the technical specifications on what went into building your product so product in our case will be the software so the technical specification of what went into building this software now examples could be um, let's say this is xyz.com this is a site now if this were built using Java code you know pro programming languages Java if this was using um, web services uh, SOAP UI service, SOAP services or REST services or if you, this was using XML for its data transmission uh, and if this was using say uh, a MySQL or DB2 some sort of a server at the back end all of these details become the technology that is used to build the software now back to how is this relevant to testers does it matter how the software is built or you know what was used in building the software when we are trying to test it um, ninety percent of the time no it does not matter how the software is built because at the end of the day whatever testing we do as functional testers I know we haven't discussed what functional testing means yet I will talk about that um, going forward but the kind of testing that we are going to discuss here in this program that has nothing to do with how the product is built all we are interested in is 
what kind of input can it take? What are its capabilities? Is it being able to satisfy its capabilities or not? And that's where ends our job. We are not going to, none of these specifications make a difference in how we test or you know what we test or any of those um, other testing related logistics. But on the other hand, is it good to know what the product that you have been you know working on is based upon? Definitely yes. Next is platform. Platform is again um, slightly related to technology, but this is about where will the product run. So this is about where will the product be used. Running is nothing but um, executed. So here's the deal. So you might be actually building a car in a garage, but that's not where it runs, isn't it? It needs to go on the actual road. It needs to actually be in its real-time conditions, real-time running conditions. The same, that's exactly what platform means. Platform usually means what is the operating system that it's running on. So there are many applications that run on Windows platform. There are many that run on Unix, um, Mac, so on and so forth. So Platform simply means that the specifications of the target system where your product is intended to run. Last definition team, um, and I really want your participation here. So what is testing? What do you think is testing team? Preventing and detecting the errors, fair enough, thank you. Validating the functions of a software, testing is the process of identifying errors, great. Any other definitions? All right, thank you, great definitions. Now testing is actually, uh, I mean the book definition, um, Finding errors in a piece of code, product develop, is it meeting the specifications, testing is the product of identity, okay. Removal of defects and making a product effective. So here's what I have a list of things based on your answers. Testing is to prevent, find, and remove errors. Can I conclude this is correct? I mean, can I conclude, uh, I mean, this is, um, you know, based on all of your inputs, um, this is the definition I, I have. I mean, this is the three activities. Um, finding if the code does the work fits its purpose. Thank you. That's a good one. Now, testing is an activity that we perform to make sure that the product works as intended. Oh, that's a bad spelling of intended. Pardon me. <laughs> Okay, so testing is an activity where you're actually um, going to check if a product works as intended. Now, let's say I bought a new toaster. I don't know why toaster, but toaster. Let's assume I bought a toaster. Now, what would I do with the toaster? Like, let's say I bought it for the intention of testing a toaster. How would I go about it? Do you think I will look for errors? I will look for whether it can toast or not. one or two team, do you think, which, which one would I do? Do I, when I buy, buy a toaster just for testing, will I go look for errors? Will I go, or will I just toast and see whether it works or not? The, say, the second one, isn't it? So testing is never really about finding bugs. Testing is about validating whether it is doing what it's supposed to do. And when it does not do, when the product falls short, we have found ourselves a bug. So that's what it is. Testing is never about bugs. So when testing is not even about finding bugs, it is never about preventing or removing bugs. Removing is definitely out of scope for testers because uh, we, do, we are not developers. So when you say software is code and software has bugs, and when you have a bug, how do you fix it? You have to go manipulate the code so that the bug is eliminated, isn't it? So since we don't possess the technical expertise, nor does it fall under the boundaries of our job description, defect removal is generally not our job. Uh, preventing to a certain extent, I would say that's true, uh, but then that is not the exact testing activity, that is QA. QA is called quality assurance. This is something we'll discuss going forward. 
Usually testing teams are called QA teams because we not only find errors but we also prevent bugs. Uh, but testing as an activity is simply to make sure that the product works as intended which means we don't go looking for bugs. We go and check whether the product is working as it's supposed to work and when it's not we would have found an error effectively. So defect prevention to a certain yes but not like you know as far as the testing activity the core testing activity goes no it's also not about finding bugs it's also not about removing the bugs removing the bugs is definitely out of scope for testers job our job ends as soon as we find the defect and we pass it on to the respective teams which is in most cases the development team okay so Yes, uh, that actually brings us to an end of a long vocabulary section. Um, now let's move on to the main uh, part of the program, which is um, software development lifecycle. Now what is software development lifecycle? One thing that I find uh, very useful when I'm trying to learn new concepts is try to look at the name. I mean, why do you think this particular process has a particular name, right? So software development, we understand that, you know, we're talking about developing a particular software life cycle. So in the course of this program, we'll discuss the software testing life cycle, defect life cycle, risk life cycle, release life cycle, uh, bug life cycle. So there are like many life cycles that we will keep on discussing in this program and even after when you um, you know are trying to learn something else life cycle simply means the stages life cycle means that something is transitioning so again bad spelling so something is transitioning so software development starts from a zero isn't it so when you start with it you're absolutely starting at point zero and you're building on to achieving you know what you would call a software that works like you know workable software all the necess all the Im intermediary stages and how does transition happen between one stage to another is what is uh, you know encompasses the software development life cycle so software development life cycle is nothing but the step by step process of how software is built um, so this is like you know bug life butter butterfly life cycle which actually you know um, it, th that's what it reminds me, you know, um, because that has nothing to do with software, but, you know, that's the name you have. It just means that dif the different stages, the different phases, uh, one transitioning from the other, but then, you know, it, it's a continuous process. So one of the software development lifecycle processes that we will discuss in class is called waterfall model. Uh, the waterfall model personally is my favorite. It's the classic, and this has been used um, to build software systems since forever and it's still prevalent in the market. Um, waterfall model is also called a linear model and we'll, we'll see why. We'll also see why it's called waterfall model. There is a reason why it's named so. So waterfall model or the linear model is like the classic but one thing that we need to understand before we even go into the waterfall model is software development is part of a business it's an it's actually you know it's part of the IT business and there are three important people um, who are affected by the business for one the client client is nothing but let's say I'm a car dealer okay and so far I have a physical business which is a brick and mortar like you know physical showroom where I engage in buying and selling cars but I want to do this online because online businesses have great benefits, isn't it? They are available 24 by 7. There's no infrastructure costs. I mean, little infrastructure costs. And, you know, um, they're much more convenient. And the whole world is shifting towards it. So definitely going online might be good for my business. So when I decide to do that, can I do it myself? Probably not, isn't it? Because I'm a car dealer and I don't have the technical expertise to make it happen. So in that case, what would I do? I would get in touch with somebody called the software service provider, somebody who can build this product for me. So this is the second, you know, category of people who are affected in the software development process. Lastly, just so this person will build something called cars.com, something to that effect. Now, once I have cars.com, will it be either used by the client or the, you know, software service provider? Not necessarily, isn't it? This is actually for people who are 
en uh, trying to engage I mean customers of the client so basically we have end users or real-time customers who are going to use the product so we have three important parties in the process of uh, when we talk about a software in the context of software so we have a client who is the business owner also called the business owner so we have a software service provider or these these people are also called the builders uh, who will build the software and finally it's the end users customers or the audience whichever way you want to call them so there are three stakeholders now end users is something that we cannot really you know um, so this is the consumers this is where this is the side of the business um, people basically so within the business this is how it goes so when the client recognizes that there is a need or there is a requirement that needs to be built into a software they're not going to just you know go to the first uh, software service provider and get it done right so let's say you want your um, let's say you you're looking for maybe I don't know somebody to build your house or something we don't just go hand it over to the first person we see on the road isn't it we are going to do some shopping around same thing happens with the client and the service provider as well so what the clients do is um, team are you all able to hear me okay because nothing has changed from my end okay sometimes if you are facing a problem with the audio make sure that you know there are no other applications open um, and all that beyond that I don't know what I don't know um, let me know if the problem still persists we will see what we can do about that all right moving on so the client um, has a need or a requirement and they approach so they will actually uh, you know make a list of what is that they want so it might be a time frame they might want this in the next three months right and probably a few like list of requirements so you would want like a site where you can do business and you will define what is it that you want to do so maybe the client wants to start with simple like you know selling cars so they just want to create an inventory list online and they want to provide a facility where you know the person who is viewing the car can make an appointment um, at the dealership or if they can buy it something like that so they will have to define decide what is the scope of the project what can it do what should be the limitations all of this also they might have a budget in mind um, they might also have like you know few other requirements like you know something should be easy to maintain because they don't want to build the site that will need like you know constant babysitting from a technical team so they might have their own set of requirements so these requirements that usually get passed on from the client to the service provider are called business requirements because here the clients focus is his business not necessarily the website because that website right now does not exist at this stage it does not exist all they want to do is they want to expand their business so all the requirements that they have in terms of expanding their business into the virtual world is called the are called the business requirements we'll talk more about this so what the clients will do is they will set this you know particular set of requirements and they would publish these requirements to multiple software service providers so each service provider what they will do is um, so all of this is pre software development lifecycle team so these are the steps that happen before the waterfall model begins and don't worry if this is not making a lot of sense because we are never involved in this process this is something we are just learning for our information that's all now each service provider what they would do is they would let me actually they would get the requirements they would figure out what is the need and then they would perform a feasibility analysis now feasibility analysis is something that we will again it's a term that we will hear over and over and what it simply means is the simple question can we do it or not so clients are may or may not be computer savvy so sometimes they might come up with requirements that are simply not possible to be implemented through softwares um, this is actually a real request one time we were building a product for hospital management systems and um, you know we've had a discussion and one lady came to us and said um, this site should have a user ID and password but it should not be the same as the one the user will use for the insurance company that's something we can never impose on the 
you know user we can't say that hey you've used the same password for your insurance you will not be able to use it for here because for one we can never know what the insurance password was in the first place so even though software can be pretty effective there are some things that software cannot do so feasibility analysis is nothing but picking up all the business requirements and deciding can we build it or no then make technology decisions like what's or what uh, databases to use and all that infrastructure decisions like where do we do it do we do it like you know um, in-house on site do you do we do it like you know um, in a two team framework one team framework so all of that stuff followed by people what kind of people are we looking for what kind of skills do we need do we have them already do we need to hire them so all of those staffing decisions are made so once each software service provider makes these decisions they would prepare something called a proposal document a proposal document has all of these things um, a proposed solution schedules technology budget ETA is nothing but you know when will we deliver uh, ETA stands for expecting expected time of arrival so it's something that is used in the context of firefighters so it's like you know ETA for the firefighters to come is 10 minutes or something so it's like when can we expect work to be done in simple terms then you know what kind of maintenance do they need service level agreements legal contracts so it, all of these details is uh, presented to the client now clients will get multiple proposals from multiple software service providers and the clients will decide which one is a good option which one is you know probably um, uh, better quality for less money so all of these decisions are made and the uh, client will decide on which service provider they are going to go with so all of these activities that we are talking about here the client approaching the software service provider they are they preparing a proposal document coming back to the client all of these things are pre SDLC and these are not even done by the testing team these are done by what um, there are teams called pre sales teams which are you know which go bring business to IT companies so they talk to clients understand their needs prepare proposals and all of that so why we are talking about this is here's why once this proposal is accepted by a client that's when the software development lifecycle begins so I just wanted it to be a continuous thread rather than we start abruptly at the place where software development lifecycle starts that is the reason why we are discussing this so once the proposal is accepted um, the traditional so in the traditional waterfall model project this is how the project would begin you would start with the initiate so there are six stages initiate define design code test and deploy again we will talk about this a lot a lot a lot going forward so let's get started and discuss what this uh, what the different steps mean uh, what are the activities carried out so on and so forth and this is a great introductory topic to start our course because as I said it's not just important to be good at what you do it's also important to understand what the um, other people uh, involved in a software development project are what are their roles and responsibilities what kind of inputs can you expect from them what kind of inputs would they expect from you so it's important to understand this process because IT projects are always always based on a team framework so this is a great topic that will um, introduce us to all that and much more so before we go to the software development lifecycle do you have any questions team so there was one question about is this the running notes no this is not the running notes this is just a way for you to um, this is like the whiteboard or something so but then as we discuss much more formal concepts we will uh, note down things in this Excel sheet and that will be the running notes you'll get any questions so far team is everything making sense okay so software development life cycle the waterfall or linear model So it has six stages initiate define design so we'll go ahead and keep writing as we go and whenever we are discussing any formal method we will talk about um, it's very important to understand three things that we will start with and we'll keep adding more and more to that and the first one is what is the input that is when do we start this process and the second thing that we need to understand is output that is 
when do we stop finally we also need to understand who are the actors or who does this work right um, yeah so let's start with this we'll also probably talk about what this process is and how this is done maybe so yeah let's let's start with this now initiate is the very first stage of the project uh, software development lifecycle stage uh, project uh, so what was I saying yeah initiate is the very first stage of the software development lifecycle so it's like the inception of a uh, particular project so this is where the basic teams get formed so initially you have somebody called a project manager this person is like you know responsible for the delivery of the entire product and they will have to take care of all the teams that is uh, development team QA team so they are like you know um, the one point contact for making sure that the entire project runs as on track so the second actor who gets involved at this stage is the business analyst so business analyst is somebody who is a domain knowledge expert and Business analysts are also called SMEs, subject matter experts. So essentially, these people are very good at understanding two things. They understand business and they understand software as well. So ideally, if we are looking at the same cars product project, business analyst for this project would be someone who knows the car dealership business and at the same time he has good understanding about um, the virtual systems that implement or you know that actually in um, make the car dealership process happen so these are people who have a fair amount of understanding of business models software systems um, and etc so to make sure that you know um, the business has an equivalent virtual entity so this is what I mean so when you go to a grocery shopping say for example these are the sequence of things that we would do we would browse for what we need we would choose them that is we add to cart and then we probably like you know at the end of it where if we want to remove something we've, so you can update your cart that is you know uh, with whatever you want and then what do we do we check out and during checkout we could pay in cash um, we could pay with cards, checks, so on and so forth. So there are all of these multiple things that you can do in the store. So when you look at the same equivalent Walmart.com, the same things you can, you can actually do online virtually. So this kind of smooth transition from a store model to an online model is something that is taken care of by the business analysts they create call, what is called the business models that are later implemented by development teams uh, to build what is the walmart.com or some such site so it is very important for the business analyst to understand the core business at the same time understand how he can uh, translate the same thing into a virtual medium so business analysts are very very important and in this stage the third uh, actor who get in who are who play a prominent role is the clients themselves so what happens in this stage so what happens in this stage is BAs project managers and clients they have regular meetings they talk to one another they discuss and finalize what should be the scope of the project so what is it that the use uh, client wants and you know what is it that they are looking for what are the time frames they're looking for all of these details now you might be wondering aren't all of these details discussed already in the pre SDLC stage well they might be but here's the deal in the pre SDLC stage the only teams that get involved are the pre sales teams so the people who are actually going to build the software are not involved at that point so they don't really know what the requirements of the client have been so it is again a task to sit down get the scope one more time make sure that you know it is in line with the pre-sales and also you know perform another feasibility analysis because these are the people who will be actually implementing them this on the floor um, so the scope is defined business requirements are collected
and um, um, project plan is drawn. So basic project plan on you know kind of when do we start, when do we stop, what are the milestones, all of those are um, figured out. So this is mostly in the form of meetings, brainstorming, uh, exchange of ideas basically. Uh, the input to start this stage is the proposal document. Proposal is finalized. Um, now, never will QA teams get, I mean, normally it's it's not normal that QA teams write the proposals or have access to the proposals. Proposals are usually very confidential documents, regularly not, I mean, commonly not uh, made available to the QA team members because they have details like, you know, billing rates and all that, which is confidential and is usually um, secure document uh, but then the very fact that the proposal is finalized and the project starts this is called the project kickoff process once the project officially starts kickoff is nothing but the official beginning uh, the initiate process begins and once then so once all of um, and then the client uh, the business man uh, the, the project manager and the business analyst they all sit down and figure out um, what is the scope, what are the business requirement, and then we create a basic project plan. Now at the end of this stage, we would have something called a business requirement document. So all the discussions, all the you know back and forth um, deliberation of the scope will decide to finalizing what are the requirements from the perspective of the business of the client. So these things are recorded in a document, document uh, called the business requirement document or the BRD. In addition to the BRD, you would also have something called a project plan document. Um, this is prepared by the project manager. BRD document is prepared by the business analyst. So the output of this particular stage is um, both the BRD and the project plan document. Now going forward, the next stage is the define stage. Usually in the waterfall model, the input for a particular stage is the output for the previous stage. So in the define stage, what happens is business requirements are translated or transformed into functional requirements. So let me explain this a little bit. Now business requirements, so there are two entities when we are looking at um, any IT project. One is the business and the second is the software that enables the business. So while we are in the stage of um, business requirement gathering, that is when we are in the stage of BRD creation, we are focusing only on the car dealership business. What does it need? It needs an online medium, so it needs an online site, website, and this site has to be accessible both on mobile and web applications. And what should it be able to do? It should be able to create an inventory and sell cars. For now, they should be able to sell cars. Now, by the time we move to the defined stage, the focus is no longer the business. The focus is the software. Now, when we say software, how should the software accomplish this, right? So as soon as you log in, maybe there should be a home page. I mean, as soon as you try to access the car site, there has to be a home page where there has to be like, you know, search or a browse option. Which one is it? I mean, deciding on how this, um, the software and, you know, um, how the software accomplishes the task of selling a car, what are the options it should have, how should it be designed, all of these details go into functional design um, stages. So that is the defined stage. So from the browse, you can select it. Once you select it, you can actually check it out. Uh, you, can, you have options to pay it by credit card there itself, or you can pay in the physical location. So all of these, you know, uh, the menu options, the page by page description of how it should do it or, you know, what it should do, all the details and, you know, limits of the software are decided uh, in the defined stage. So how, sh how can a particular software accomplish a business requirement? So the, the business requirements are translated into functional requirements in the defined stage. The input for this is clearly we need a business requirement document. 
um, who is involved here so usually this stage is pretty much carried out by the business analyst and the development team because they will have to develop the software isn't it so the development team and the business analyst they make a combined decision on how they can transform the business requirements and incorporate them into the system uh, as system or functional requirements so how does this happen this also is usually mostly meetings and this is also work um, you know um, uh, working hand in hand creating a lot of diagrams so there are lots of you know um, things like use cases uh, use case creation so there's a lot of work involved not just like you know talking one on one um, the output of the defined stage is usually another document which is called the functional requirement document or the FRD. This is also called the functional um, specifications document or this is also called the uh, SRS system requirement specification. So whatever name it's called it's all the same. Different teams use different uh, naming conventions. Any questions so far team? Everything making sense? Perfect. All right, so once the define stage is done, we move on to what is called the design stage. So design stage is technical, technical implementation of how we are going to do it. So I would say here that there has to be a menu where the user can search, browse, and submit a request to, you know, probably get in touch with the dealer or whatever it might be. So the menu option should have these details. The menu option should have like maybe other options as well, right? So one thing is design gets, design detail, design is a stage where all the technical details are charted out. That is, um, how should the front end look? So the page wise physical design of um, placement of different components, how, how should it look like? Those things are decided. Then the implementation, like for example, if you are supposed to use like a Java class to make, you know, um, a particular Java class to um, accomplish the calendar function or something like that, all of those implementation related details are also present here. So if you're using an XML, what should be the, you know, um, how should this be structured? What should be the structure or uh, you know, how should be the layout of this XML? And if you're using a database, um, what kind of table structures are you going to use? How are you going to define your tables? What should be the columns be? Uh, where should the data go? So all of these technical details, like, you know, how can you, like so far, in the business requirements, you're planning on how to accomplish the business. In the system requirement, you're doing the same thing, but here you're focusing exactly only on on the software so you're planning on how the software should be and in the design stage uh, the activity that gets conducted is how should you accomplish the system requirements that you have come up with so it, inc it could include designing the first day, um, front end that is you know uh, the look and feel placement of objects. It could be like de designing the XML structure, database, so on and so forth. So all the details related to implementation are carried out. So the input for the design stage is the functional requirement document and the output for uh, the design stage is a technical design document. And this stage is mostly done by development team and the other technical teams. So these technical teams could be data architects, they can be HTML designers. Um, they could be any other, you know, some people who are going to take care of installations, etc. So any other technical uh, teams that can help us with the process become uh, integral part of the de uh, design stage. Now, what's important to note is, even though we are not mentioning that, you know, in the defined stage, the project manager is there, the project manager is always going to uh, play the role of a coordinator and make sure that things are moving along smoothly. Similarly, when we come to the design stage, the project manager also has an involvement, but again, passive slightly. And also the business analyst will also overlook the entire process because the business analyst has to make sure that at every stage that the project um, you know, um, 
evolves. So as the project is evolving and in every stage, it is the job of a business analyst to make sure that the product at every place is in line with the business targets that it is supposed to achieve. Otherwise, it's going to be completely useless, isn't it? You could build something that looks great, but at the end of the day, if it does not satisfy the business needs, you have essentially failed at building a project, building an IT product. So that is why business analysts are constantly involved, making sure that every activity that we do is lined up, uh, is targeted at achieving the business goals. Um, so what is this here? Technical implementation. are listed and defined. Um, yeah, so this could be design, this could be database, this could be program and its structure, programming language related details, all of that. Um, this is also both meetings and work, a um, lot of documentation creation. Now after design we have the code code is straightforward for us to understand. To write effective code, you would need all the documents, uh, functional requirement document, technical document, business requirement document, so any sort of reference. So what happens here is actually code is created, like you know, um, that means programming for the creation of the software takes place in this stage. So this is where actual implementation begins. So far it's all about planning and deciding and you know, deciding about what to do, how to do in each stage. It's all about making decisions. But in the coding stage is where actually work gets done. Software starts taking shape. The physical component of building the product starts taking shape. So this is predominantly taken care of by the development team. Um, and of course technical teams, business analysts are all uh, and then project management team, they are all involved passively making sure that everything is going fine. At the end of the coding stage, you would have a code that is ready to test. And this is actually, you know, um, how in the sense code is created using different technologies and all that. Um, the fifth stage of software development lifecycle is test. So to test again, you would need the code, of course, um, that is to be tested. And then output of this, we will talk about that. And here in the test stage, it is the QA or the software testing team that gets involved. Um, and of course, business analysts are here, project managers are here, um, development team is here to fix bugs that we find but all of them have like you know a secondary role to play the primary role is that of the quality team or the testing team to make sure that the product is you know fit for use basically um, the product is tested and also once all the coding is done the product starts to look like how it would look to the end users. Here's what I mean. Let's say I had like, you know, a search component that I have to include. I have to include a browse component. This is my page. I have included all of these components. There are different like, you know, um, probably there is if there is a deal that shows up here. So at the end of the day, when all the coding is done, this is something that looks like the product. So this will be something, um, this will be similar to the customer facing product, isn't it? once all the coding is done. Now once it comes to the QA or the test stage for testing, you are going to actually look at a product that starts to resemble the final system, isn't it? So that is why the testing that we are trying to do here is called the system testing. So this is pretty much system testing stage. Okay, we'll talk more about what system testing means. Um, and at the end of system testing, what you would have is code that is ready to go live that is ready to go to its you know users um, of course there are intermediary stages because just because we are testing it doesn't mean you know it is working isn't it there might be bugs the bugs will eventually get fixed so by the end of it but um, 
what I'm trying to say here is, even though it involves like you know multiple stages of revalidating, re um, you know making sh there might be some fixes that need to go into place, but at the end of the day, once test stage is a hundred percent complete, we can say that the product is ready to go live, right? And what happens here? Um, system is tested. And also another stage of testing is conducted here. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So basically once testing is done, there is the code that is ready to go live. So finally we have something called the deploy. Now deploy is just a fancy term to say install. Now what deploy does is um, the input for this is clearly the output of the previous stage. That is code, tested code. So once we have the tested code, the team that is involved here who takes care of deployment is called the deployment team. Deployment is nothing but installing the application in a way that it is accessible to its end users, like you know the car customers. Um, so this is also called the deployment team. This team that takes care of installations is also called the support team. Um, again, it all means the same. Different companies have different names as all. Well. Or this could also be the operations team, environment team. So any of those names are uh, applicable. So these teams are um, going to, like you know, install the code in the real live environment, and the output is that the product is live and is available to its customers or audience or whoever. So that basically finishes the software development lifecycle. Now at the end of the deploy stage, once the product goes live, it depends on what kind of agreements the client and the um, you know, service provider has. So if they have any maintenance agreement, like you know, um, if they say that you know, we are going to be on standby, if any issues come up, we will fix it for about one year. After that, you will have to be on your own. So some sort of agreements like that are usually in place. But the development part, that is actually called the maintenance part of the project. But as far as development is concerned, once the deploy stage is reached, the project is 100% complete. So as you can see, this is a waterfall or a linear model because the output of one stage is the input for the next. That means you cannot start, initiate, and define simultaneously. You will have to wait for initiate to be completely done so you can move to define and you'll have to wait for define to be a completely done, uh, to be 100% done for you to move to design. So because of the nature, uh, because of this exact nature, it is a linear model and because you know of how the input and output fall from one stage to another, it's also called a waterfall model. Any questions on the basic model team? This is like, you know, uh, as I said, something that I feel like is very organic to how software gets built real time. So any questions on this model? Is everybody able to follow through? Is everything making sense? No questions? OK. Yes, I'm going to send this notes. Perfect. So all right, so let me ask you a question. Um, so let's actually consider a situation. Let's assume the project started in January. So let's assume all January, the initiate stage was going on. All February, um, the defined stage was going on. Again, hypothetically, this is not possible, but let's assume every stage takes an you know, equal amount of time, and this is how it went on. Um, then came March uh, design, April code, and May is test, right? So test, we all understand. We are testers, so here we are. Now let's say as a tester you've come in May and you're trying to test let's say we have like the next four weeks to test this product what do you think is the first thing that we do do you think we will just have this so here we know that by the time the software moves into the test stage you would have the system just the way it would be um, you know it is pretty much the customer facing product that you have here so that means Let's say this is like a calculator application. So do you directly start adding 2 plus 2 and, you know, 2 minus 2 or so on and so forth? Do you think this is what we do? So do we directly start working with the product? Do you think so, team? Now let's actually take one step back and 
and see what the definition of testing is. Testing is actually to make sure the product works as intended. Now for a calculator we know that when you say 2 plus 2 it is supposed to add but what if it's a complicated insurance claim? Will you know how the system is supposed to work? So the intended behavior, is it that easy to know that we can come in the end like you know right before the product is ready to go live? Do you think we can come in the end just test? That is commonly not effective. So testing even though the mention of the testing activity happens only in stage 5 of the software development life cycle, testing teams are involved way ahead. Now if you look at the ISO standard rules, uh, they actually, ISO is a, you know, a kind of uh, process certification where they will lay out few guidelines on how to do our work for maximum efficiency. So if you look at the ISO uh, standards, they recommend that the testing team should be involved in the initiate phase itself for maximum benefits. So strictly speaking, this is the waterfall model. Now if we were to, since we are testers, we want to know how testing happens, how, how does, uh, I mean, where are we involved, what is it that we do? Let's actually take a look at what is it that we do while the initiate stage is happening, what could be our involvement, who are the team members within a QA team and what are our roles and responsibilities while the you know uh, main activities are going on in the software test development lifecycle. So look at, let's look at the QA team and the QA responsibilities. What is it that we do in this stage? Now ideally what ISO recommends is that we join this initiate meetings along with the client and we kind of you know um, work along with them and figure out um, how much time it will take to test in the initial stage itself. Uh, that's what the ISO recommends but normally in the most practical sense in the initiate stage QA team does not get involved and even if we do get involved it's normally counterproductive because there's a lot of you know finalizing happening between the client and the business analyst so nothing is final so there's no concrete ground for us to base our testing estimations on so for this reason initiate stage there is usually no involvement uh, for the uh, QA team. So I, I, again, you know, I know ISO standard <laughs> means well, uh, but practically I also do not see any um, use for the QA team to get involved here. But if they were to be involved in the initiate phase, what we would do is we would work along with the business analyst and the client, stay there and understand the nature of the business and the targets that the business is trying to reach um, through this new endeavor. So that's what we will try to learn if we were to be a part of initiate phase, but normally we aren't. So we usually get started in the defined stage and usually QA team is not a constant size always and this is something we'll discuss more and more going forward. So QA team starts small because the actual work is only in stage 5. Here what we are doing is merely preparing. We are only preparing for um, testing effectively in order to understand what is the intended system behavior, right? So what we would do is here is in the defined stage, usually it is only the QA lead who gets involved and think about what inputs do we have to work with, right? The QA lead at this point will have the output that was in the previous stage because the current stage's input um, or output, the current stage's output is currently being worked on, right? So the QA lead also will have the exact same input as the development team does. So QA lead at this point will have a BRD to work on and also the project plan, right? So based on that, what the QA lead will do is understand the testing scope. Right, you know, what are the things that we want to test and, you know, try to basically understand what is the business target of the system. That's all we, we will get to, you know, kind of figure out. And based on the project plan, we can create a test plan document. Uh, again, this will not be a final version, just a draft. Now, why wouldn't it be a final version is a question that we might ask. And that's something, again, we will talk about it more and more as we go forward. But the reason why we cannot make a complete test plan is, so far, again, when we are testing, we are going to test, going back to the two entities, we have two entities, which is the software and the business. And where do we conduct our um, testing? Is it on one or two team? Where do we conduct our testing? Is it on the software or on the business? Always on the software, isn't it? For us, 
we are going to conduct testing only on the software, not on the business, because how can we, you know, even touch the business at in, a, in any point? So because we have to test, test the software, we need to understand the scope of the software. I mean, it's a good thing to know, like, you know, keep things in perspective on what the final uh, target of the system is. But, it, but when you're looking at, like, day-to-day -day work level, what you have to really work on is the software. So here's, like, you know, an example. Now, when you are like you know a tester on walmart.com you would be testing the walmart.com application and not necessarily on whether or not you know walmart.com's business policies are correct so it's never about the business it's always about the software as long as testing is concerned so to to basically plan a concrete um, you know, to come up with a concrete strategy on how you're going to test, what is it that you're going to test, you need to know everything about the software. And how would you know everything about the software? Once you look at the FRD or the SRS document. Unless you have this, you cannot plan effectively. But on the other hand, based on the project plan, you can come up with an initial draft because, again, you know, they might decide that, you know, testing will come up actually in May and they might have planned to uh, uh, have like three to four resources based on their budget so you do know these logistics of how many people what is the time frame you know tentative time frame tentative milestones so based on that we can plan a basic version of the test plan but not entirely you can plan it entirely only after the functional requirement document can be reviewed which is not yet available in the defined stage right so the basic draft is prepared and scope of testing to the extent possible is defined as well Next, going to the define stage, here the QA team gets involved. So when I say QA team, it involves the lead, so I'm not going to write QA team and the QA lead. So one or two testers get involved at this point, and here, remember, we have the functional requirement document. So we can actually write a test plan document, um, and we can also create the test documentation. So in other words, what we are going to do is we are going to prepare for testing. So test preparation. So the first thing that we have to do in order to prepare for testing is to understand requirements. So how do we understand requirements? By reviewing the FRD document, talking to the business analyst. So there will be like multiple induction meetings at this point where we are trying to go back and forth on understanding the functionality of the system. So once we have that, so once we know what the requirements are and you know how they function, we will figure out what to test in each of these requirements and how to test them. And if we need, do we need any special data? Do we need any special, you know, conditions that need to come true for us to be able to do that? So all that documentation we create while the application is being built. Finally, when the application is being built, we go ahead and test it. And here, remember, we do something called functional testing. Functional testing is, again, at the level of understanding the system's functions. We'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, probably tomorrow, the difference between functional and non-functional testing. Uh, but here, what we would do is we would perform the testing of the entire system as the QA team. And as I said here, this is system testing. There is another level of test, uh, testing that goes on. Now, if you were to follow the SDLC waterfall model strictly, what happens after testing? It goes to deploy. That means the QA team, which is actually a software service provider, you know, somebody who belongs to the software service provider side, once they say that, you know, this is yes, and you know that, I mean, when we say it's fit to use, we are basically saying, yes, the product can go live. The product goes live. Now, does this mean that the client is not involved in this decision? Because at the end of the day, we are trying to satisfy the client. The client is the ultimate decider of whether or not they want to use the product for their business, right? So let's say somebody wanted you to build a banner that they want to hang in front of their you know, business. And you build something that you think is right. But at the end of the day, whether the other person wants to hang it in front of their uh, you know, shop or not depends on whether they think it will be beneficial for the business or not, isn't it? So at the end of the day, the client is the one who takes the delivery. So it's, it is not the QA team's decision. It is not the testing team's decision. It's not the project manager's or the software pro service provider's decision whether or not it goes to deployment. 
the client has to make that call. So there is another stage of testing between the system testing and the product going live and that's called UAT. Um, so UAT stands for user acceptance testing or simply acceptance testing. So user acceptance testing is done by the client to make sure that you know the product is fit to use. Now at the end of the day the client is not going to test as thoroughly as the QA team but they're going to check few highlights of the software and determine if they're satisfied with it or not. So this is like let's say you you know um, gave your car out for servicing but you're not just going to like you know uh, bring it back without test driving isn't it? You'll have to you, you just want to make sure that whatever you wanted fixed is it fixed or not? Is it fixed to your satisfaction or not? So it's not just enough if the person who is fixing it thinks it's fixed. It's also important that you be satisfied with whatever action that's been taken on you know your car. So same thing is uh, true with software as well. So just because the QA team thinks or the project management thinks that the product is ready it does not mean it can go live. The clients also put, uh, put the system to test. So once this um, testing stages so there are two stages of testing here system testing and then the UAT testing now this is usually carried out by the um, client um, or clients representatives um, at the end of it you would have a acceptance ready software now here if they decide to if they are satisfied with the product it goes live if they're not satisfied with the product they're again going to have to revisit it make some changes and you know uh, make sure it is as um, per their instructions. Um, so there's system testing, UAT testing and here the QA team also gets involved in the UAT testing in terms that we support the testing process. Like you know we are on standby just in case the client needs any help we provide that help. So QA team gets involved way ahead of time rather than just come in the test stage and strictly just test. What we do here is we get involved ahead of time so that we have enough time under, to understand, prepare and plan for the testing activity and make sure that we, you know, um, test in a much more cognitive and educative manner than haphazardly coming and pushing some buttons at the end. So that is the QA team's involvement. Any questions team? Okay, so now that we've talked about system and UAT testing already, there are other, there are like four stages of testing or you know, four uh, types of testing that happen to a particular software product. Again, we will discuss more and more on this tomorrow. Um, so these are unit integration, system, UAT. So these are the four testing uh, levels that happen to every software product. Unit and integration testing are done during the coding stage and these are done by the developers. System testing is done by the QA team or the software testing team and this is done during the test stage of the SDLC. UAT is taken care of by the client um, and this is done also during the test stage of the SDLC. Let's briefly define what each one is. Um, so that you know tomorrow we'll actually talk more and more on this. Now while the development team is you know coding the product um, it will not be I mean first of all IT teams um, I mean any work in an IT project happens on a team member basis. So what I'm trying to say is one person might not build the whole product. Even if they do, they might not do it in one go, right? So software gets built piece by piece, you know, uh, part by part or unit by unit. So basically a unit of code is nothing but a piece of code that um, piece of code that works as an autonomous body. So here's what I mean. Let's say um, there is a calculator. So this calculator should do both, uh, should do like addition, subtraction, right, multiplication, so on and so forth. So there are like, you know, many, many mathematical operations that this calculator is supposed to do. But as I said, all of this might not be done on 
like you know one particular day right so let's say on a particular day the developer has created code that will perform addition so let me write some pseudocode again this will this is really not any programming language uh, just some pseudocode so x is equal to value 1 y is equal to value 2 uh, result is equal to x plus y and at the end of it, it has to print the result and you know show whatever is x plus y. So assuming this is the code to perform addition, this is not the complete code, we understand. So this is a part of the code. But can this work by itself? If I just give like x and y values, it will give you an answer, isn't it? So pseudocode means this is not really, this is not a programming language, this will not work. Just to give us an idea of how it works, it's like, you know, just sample code. Um, so something that appears like a code but it's not code. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. So this is basically a unit of code. It can accomplish a particular task but this task is not a complete task. It's something that is a part of the whole thing. So unit testing can be done as, as soon as a particular unit of code is built and unit of code is uh, you know a few programming uh, language lines that can work as an autonomous unit so here as long as I supply X and Y it will supply me with result so once this basic unit is ready developers will test this particular piece of code and once this is done they'll put it aside and they will test code in terms of units so unit 1 might be addition Unit 2 might be subtraction. So basically you have all of these units that you know are, are written separately and tested individually to make sure that they work. Okay. Now important thing to note here is how does the developer test the addition code? So there are four lines of code, isn't it? Do you think the developer will print it on a paper, print the code on a paper, read it line by line and decide that it works? Yes or no, team? Do you think that's what they do? Do you think the developer will read through the code and decide that it works? No, right? Because it might not work. But then how do they work with it? Do they get hands-on? Do they supply like different values of X and Y? Probably a, a positive X, Y, a positive Y. Uh, so let's say positive value for X, positive value for Y, negative value for X, positive for Y. Maybe they'll supply like, you know, values that have decimals. So do you think they will provide all of these different input sets and check the corresponding output and then make sure it's working. Do you think that's what they do? Why do you think no? I, I would definitely think yes, uh, because they would want to make sure that it works in most, I mean, most common conditions, isn't it? Now, what we are trying to, what I'm trying to tell you is here is they are not going to look at something static as a paper that will not change. They are not going to read through it. They are going to interact with the system dynamically. So any form of testing that involves the tester to, in, to interact with the system dynamically uh, is called validation. And this is called verification. Now, basically, I might just read through the code and figure out that a line of the code is missing, right? So that's also a way to test, but it's not most effective. So anytime you're trying to test a particular software by reading through it is verification. And when you're actually putting it to test by interacting with it dynamic, dynamically, that's called validation. That's something we'll discuss later again. But let's assume this is what happens. I give an X and Y value and the output is incorrect. So basically my test failed or in other words, the developer has encountered a defect. So what do you think the developer will do at this point team? Do they report the defect or do they fix it? What do you think they do? They, they fix it, right? They are the ones who've created it and they, they also have the technical expertise to fix it. So they would actually fix the code. So when I say fix the code, do they have to manipulate the code? They have to, isn't it? So they have to really, so they cannot actually, you know, forget about what's in the middle. They can't just give an input and get an output, right? They have to actually look through the logic or look through the individual lines of code to effectively perform unit test. So any kind of testing that involves the tester, in this case, the tester is the developer. Any kind of testing that involves the 
tester, the person testing, to take a look at the code, to follow through each and every line of the code while they are testing is called white box testing. Here we consider code to be a box, right? While you, while the you know uh, developer who is the tester here, uh, when they are testing a particular unit, they have to look through the code, isn't it? So this code cannot be a black box. So any kind unit testing is a white box testing technique because it involves them looking at the code. And don't worry if this does not make sense at this point. We will discuss this tomorrow one more time. So here's what we know about unit testing so far. We know that developers perform it. We know that this is a dynamic form of testing or that it's a validation technique. We also know that this is a white box testing technique, which means the developer has to look into the code and not just, um, you know, treat it as, uh, you know, one unit where he does not have to look into the programming logic. And we also know that we we also know that the developers themselves fix the code. Now, with that, let's move on to integration testing. Integration testing is when you have these pieces of code, unit one, two, three so on and so forth, putting them together, like, you know, maybe you just want to, I mean, if you put everything together at one point, probably if something is not working as a result as a whole, you probably will not be able to figure out which module is, you know, faulty, right? So usually integration testing happens with integrating one module to the other and then, you know, gradually going on to making sure that it's the whole product. Now, when the integration testing is happening, so when I say integration testing, it doesn't mean that I'm going to put unit one and unit two next to each other and it's a done deal. No, right? So when I say integrate, I'll have to write code so that these two modules work together. So integration testing, again, is um, validation because I'm not going to put them next to one another and imagine or, you know, or just assume that they work. I'll have to like put to test both of these features and see if they work or not. Let's assume this is the functionality we have. First I will view a car and then I will go into the buy screen, right? So this is actually to browse the car and this is actually to uh, make the payment and you know uh, buy the car. So let's assume these are the two modules. Now how are these two modules you know integrated because they interact with one another. So I can't just assume that you know when I view a car it will automate I can automatically buy it. I'll have to perform the validation on that. I'll have to actually dynamically do those operations and see whether or not it's happening. So it's, it is also validation technique and it also involves a little bit of programming because integrating of modules means you will have to write code so that you know they will have they can work together. And once a bug is found in the integration testing, that is also fixed by the developer, which means the developer can't just assume that this code is a black box, just provide an input, get an output, and think that it's working. They will have to look through the code, make changes if necessary, and be really aware of what the box is. The box, it has to be white for the, you know, developer to be able to look through it and you know understand it appropriately so for that reason integration testing is also a white box testing so let's look at one other thing about integration testing let's say there are four units of code okay unit one two three and four and all of them are put together so you have put one and two first together and then one two and three and then one two and four so finally you have the whole product together so at this point when I provide an input and when I receive an output I'm actually testing to make sure that the entire system works so um, this is similar to system testing isn't it so once the product is completely put together, this is similar to system testing. So since integration testing is a little bit of both, you know, white box testing and black box testing, like system testing. Like for example, in a calculator, when I'm performing the addition operation as a tester during system testing, do I care like, you know, how the code is written? I don't. For me, this, this box of code is a black box. I do not worry about what programming logic is being used, 
what statement is being uh, you know uh, invoked as a result of the operation I'm performing none of these matter to me so any kind of testing technique where you do not have to deal with the programming where you do not have to see the code that's black box testing since integration testing includes both white box and black box it is sometimes called gray box testing again we'll discuss all of this tomorrow um, just giving you a basic introduction to this so system testing and UAT testing are black box testing techniques because neither the client nor the QA testers like you and me none of us look into the code we only look at you know we provide an input to the application whether or not it is working as intended is all we check but when it comes to unit and integration testing um, the developers will make sure that you know um, the code is taken um, I mean the code is taken into consideration that it is you know kept an eye on at all times during unit and integration testing so that is why unit and integration testing are called white box testing techniques integration testing has a little bit of both black and white so that's why it's called gray box testing technique so there you have it there's one last topic of environment that I want to talk about uh, but before that I just want to make sure that you know we have no questions on this uh, because if we do I would rather take them than you know um, handle a new topic so is everything okay team any questions so there was a question earlier about if we are going to discuss um, test driven development also first of all test driven development is a topic that is um, how do I put it it's it's a it's a hypothesis that is still in the process of being um, you know um, refuted or accepted because test driven development basically focuses on testing as the primary activity then builds on then goes on you know how we can uh, build a product that focuses more on testing so this is actually a, a new experimental thing and it's not you know prevalent in the I mean it's not completely accepted by all clients and all people so um, that's not something that we'll discuss but if you are interested you know do your research if you have any questions feel free to send me an email and we can discuss that offline and if, if you feel like you want to share that with your class let me know we can do that as well uh, but as part of the class we are not going to discuss that because this program is really aimed at getting you job ready in as quick is in as little a time as possible and as thoroughly as possible so this is mostly about this is very oriented to you know real-time job situation than you know experimental uh, future things so that's the way it stands but as I said you're welcome to do your research and you know uh, questions or if you want to share that with the class you're most welcome okay um, okay so so far what we know uh, in the software development lifecycle topic is we understand the different teams so we understand what project manager does we, BA does, development team does, what QA team does. We also know what other technical teams are, um, deployment teams, so on and so forth. So we have a good understanding of people. We also understand processes, what are the documentation that you could expect, business requirement, functional requirement, technical requirement, uh, different types of testing. Now, like for example I mean we know that the QA team's involvement what what kind of activities does the QA team do in the software type development lifecycle in what stages we know that as well we also talked about what is white box testing and black box gray box testing so we talked about that briefly of course I, I admit we haven't discussed it in greater detail so we also know what unit testing is integration system and UAT testing so you see why this is my favorite topic to begin with so it's like this one topic but in a, in an hour's time there is just a lot of ground we can cover a uh, lot of things that we can um, you know uh, try and learn and that too keeping everything in context and not really running around from places so yeah with that said this one last topic that I want to talk about that is where now where does software development happen so when I say where this is what I mean let's say now let's take a look at a product as popular as Facebook right and we have something called a facebook.com where we all can use this right 
Now, Facebook is a product that is that compulsively changes like every few days, isn't it? There's something or the other that's happening new. So that means there is development happening. And finally, like users are using it. I mean, many of us are using Facebook uh, while the development, let's say, is making changes on it. Do you think this is what happens in real time? Do you think the development is changing Facebook while the users are actually using it? And when the development is changing, the QA naturally follows, isn't it? The testing naturally follows. Do you think the developers are developers, testers, and the users, that is the customers, are accepting, uh, are, are you know, actually accessing the same instance of Facebook? Do you think that's what's happening, team? Yes or no? Do you think on Facebook.com, on that one particular site, all of this is happening simultaneously? No. Why do you think it's no? Because let's assume today, I'm trying to create something on my timeline. Again, I'm not very familiar with this, so let's assume something's happening with my timeline. I'm trying to post something. And let's assume Facebook comes, take this, removes this feature as part of its development and replaces it with something else. Do you think as an end user I'll be happy? Somebody interferes into my work and you know somebody actually like overtakes it and takes off what I'm doing? No user is gonna like it. So all of these activities are going to happen in different physical locations. So it's, it'll be the same Facebook application, but spatially, space-wise, each of these different people who are acting on the product, they share a different space. Thank you. It, it does have a QA environment. So basically, every uh, company has three instances, three spaces where each of these people can do their work in peace. So there are three environments in software systems usually. There's a development environment. So environment is nothing but, let's say there is a Java, uh, you know, 3.5 or something that needs to be installed. There is like a web browser that needs to be available. There is a DB server that needs to be connected. So all of these specifications are replicated in more than one place. But each one is dedicated for one particular type of people. So right now, say Facebook version 13 is in production, right? That's what is being used by users. But development team might be working on a version 14. Or, you know, development team might be working on a, yeah, development team, let's assume they, they might be working on a version 14, which is a newer version with more features or, you know, some sort of enhancements or improvements over the product as it stands today. So they would be developing that. Once they're done, they would move that code to QA so the QA can test it. And once the QA tests, this can go into production. So while the users are now using 14, the rest of the teams can use 15. So this is to make sure that each one has their own different space so that one does not interfere in the other. Now you might ask, what happens if one interferes with the other? Now if we interfere with the production environment, it could cause a loss of satisfaction with the end users. If developers in interfere in the QA environment, QA testers might not have a very consistent environment uh, to, you know, assess their results in. So for all of these reasons, environments are separated. So the coding happens in the Q, um, development environment. So let's also add where. So the testing happens in the QA environment. Um, development happens in the development environment. And finally, the product goes into production environment. Now, when it comes to UAT, though, it could happen either in the QA or the production environment because at the end of the day, this is the choice of the client. They would probably want to test it before it goes live or immediately after it goes live. So it's it's their choice completely. So if it is in the production, uh, if, it, if the UAT happens in the QA environment, it's called alpha testing. If it happens in the production environment, it's called beta testing. So it's the same process, same thing that happens, except that the environment is different between alpha and beta. But we'll discuss more and more on that tomorrow, uh, not to worry. So this is another thing um, when um, that is worth discussing while we are discussing the software development lifecycle. So that's all I have planned for today. Now I'll open up the floor for questions. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know. I'll send out this Excel sheet in the email today um, along with the training plan and this is, is DLC. I will also add 
what today's assignment is. Again, team, there is no, uh, it's not, I, I'm not going to impose the assignment on you. Um, but if you want to just follow through the class and, you know, work in parallel to what we do uh, every day here, um, you're welcome to do the assignment. And I'll, I'll give you details about where you can send them to me and how. Um, yeah. And also we have some students who do all the assignments over the weekend and send them all in a bunch. That's okay too. Uh, so feel free to find a way that works for you. Um, so today's assignment is, again, for the first week I don't like to get technical. So we're not going to do anything like, you know, test cases, test plans, so none of those things. We will keep it simple. We'll keep it straightforward. We will also keep it, some as, as you know, uh, something that makes sense, that something that's natural and easy to adapt. So along those lines, what I would like you to do today is, since this is our first day as testers, um, we want to get some perspective on this. So what I want you all to do is take any site or any application. So it might be a web application, mobile application, or a standalone application. So any application or site. So let's uh, uh, say I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick up the Excel sheet itself. Microsoft Excel is my application. So you are free to pick anything that you want. And in this, try to list out 10 features. It's very important as testers to be able to figure out what are the features and, you know, what is the intended behavior. Uh, so take any side, take any uh, favorite application of yours. Um, I'm taking Microsoft Excel. I'm going to write uh, a few features. So try and write at least 10 features. So I'm simply, uh, I mean, in, in any uh, format or in any way you like. So I'm going to say that um, the text in a particular cell can be formatted as per font, font color, and type. And I can attach, an attachment can be added to a cell by using the insert object feature. or the spreadsheet can be saved from the home menu, so so on. So try to write at least 10 of them. If you can write more, you're welcome. So once you have that, send um, your work to me at sthcourses at the rate gmail.com. Um, if you are uh, sending it to me, like, you know, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, try to send it to me at least an hour before the class begins tomorrow. That way I'll have enough time to take a look at your assignment and provide you the feedback. Uh, if I'm late on providing the feedback by a day or two, just please bear with me. Um, I'll try and do the best that I can. Um, so that's all we have for the day. I will send you the material, bonus material part one. Um, yeah, if, uh, along with today's uh, course content and the video. So, any questions, team? Well, if there are no questions, I hope you've enjoyed today's class. Let me know um, if you have any comments, questions, feedback. Feel free to send me an email at this uh, sthcourses at gmail.com. We monitor that pretty uh, regularly. So if there's nothing else, we can sign off for today. And tomorrow we will meet with another, um, sorry about that. So tomorrow we'll meet with another uh, development life cycle, which is um, uh, V-Model. V-Model is not necessarily a very different model. It's basically a slight variation on the waterfall model, and we'll see that tomorrow. Um, yeah. So one last question, should we use the Excel sheet? Uh, if you want to use that, you're welcome. If you want to write it in, a, in the email itself, that's okay. If you want to use a notepad, that's fine. So um, any method works, basically. Okay. And any other course that you would suggest with this one? Again, that's a personal choice, really. It's too soon to tell is all I'm thinking. Or you can just actually send me an email. Uh, 
with the details and you know I'll try to get back to you okay thanks everyone have a good one I'll see you tomorrow bye bye team